Uh, so as I said, we're in Honor Code uh, is our sermon series. We're going to be in Romans chapter 13. And if you remember from last week, um, we talked about how we are called, the Bible calls us to honor each other above ourselves. Now, that doesn't mean that we're worthless. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't love ourselves. After all, the great commandment is love your neighbor as what? As you love yourself. And so people who hate themselves really struggle loving other people. And you know, when I deal with relationships, I often find this is what's most likely true. It's not that you're necessarily the problem. It's that people can just hate themselves. They're miserable with themselves. They're overworked, overweight overstressed, uh, undervalued. And so we often project our own misery onto the people around us. But the gospel provides us hope. Because Jesus died for us, we can love ourselves again. We can be loved by God again. And we can see the value in ourselves, but also the value that God has placed on other people. Because after all, we're created in his image. And so the Bible tells us we should put others above ourselves, and we will find that we will be happy, we will be full, and we will be living the Christ-centered lives that he wants us to live. But there's also an honor code that we are to live by as citizens of our country. And so that's what we're going to talk about this morning in Romans chapter 13. How in the world do we as Christians navigate this political climate? I mean, you have to admit, anytime you turn on the news, nine times out of ten, you're not going to hear a really good story. You're not going to hear something that's touching. You're going to hear something that deals with the president or deals with politics. And look, it happens every time I preach on politics. Nine times out of ten, somebody gets up and they leave and they don't come back before they listen to anything that I have to say. So if I offend you this morning with the first few words of this message, I'm sorry. Stick it through. We want to preach the Bible. I'm not here to endorse any kind of candidate, okay? Are you with me? Okay, so anyways, have you ever broken the law before? Yeah, I have. Most of you broke the law on the way to church this morning by going over the speed limit. And I can remember the first time I ever had a run-in with the law. It was actually my stepfather. Uh, he drove this little, rusted-up, dirty vehicle, um, and he actually took pride in the fact that it was dirty and he never cleaned it. It was so dirty you couldn't even read the license plate, which is the reason why he got pulled over. And so, you know, we had this, like, little, tiny rust bucket car, and um, I traveled to work with him that day, and we were on our way home from Columbus, Ohio. That's where I'm from. And he gets pulled over. Well, I didn't have my seatbelt on. And so immediately, as soon as the cop gets behind him, he tells him, he tells me, Rick, put the seatbelt on. So I grab the seatbelt and I put it on and the officer comes to the window. And the, you know what the first question he asked was, was he wearing a seatbelt? Because he saw. And right there in the tension of my stepfather's mind, I could see two things. The first thing is to do what's right and tell the truth. (laughs) The second thing is to lie and say, well, of course, he had a seatbelt on the entire time. And he actually paused for a moment. And I'll never forget it. I was really young. I was in elementary age. But he decided to tell the truth. No, officer. He was not wearing his seatbelt. And that's about the extent of my run-in with law enforcement as far as breaking the law. I usually just get pulled over for speeding. But you know what? Even when I don't speed, I hit the brakes every time I see a police officer. Do you know why? Because I'm a lawbreaker. (laughs) I'm a rebel. And if you do the same thing, it's because you probably speed. What is it that that feeling that we have whenever we're around law enforcement that causes us to feel guilty or causes us to be in fear? Well, it's because most of us don't keep the law to the fullest extent. And that's the purpose of government. You know, a lot of people, they get the purpose of government and church mixed up. They think that even though we were a Christian nation founded on Christian principles, they often think that the government should take the role of the church. And that the primary principle of government is compassion and love and grace and that and goodness and charity. When that's not the role that the Bible speaks about for government. It's not the role that we should support for our government institutions, and it's not the role that we should play as citizens of the United States. That's the role of the church. Well, what is the government's role? Well, if you have Romans chapter 13 open, we're going to read starting in verse 1. It says this, every person is to be in subjection to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those which exist are established by God. So who does this verse apply to? Everyone. Christians. This is something that we are to live by. Now, you may not like the person appointed to the government. 
You may not like the person, or maybe you yourself have had a bad experience with law officers. I actually have as well. In fact, it's one of the reasons why I sold my townhome right here in Glen Burnie is because I lived next to two individuals who were, you know, the exception, I think, to the general rule, um, because I think the second most honorable thing that you can do in our country outside of serving uh, the military is to be a police officer or a first responder. Um, we really respect and we love them. We've uh, made meals for them and thank them. And so police, uh, police officers are very important to us. Uh, we support them 100%. But I had a bad experience with a law officer. I sold my home, didn't even want to live next to this person. Uh, lo and behold, uh, both of them ended up losing their positions because because of their conduct. But it's sometimes hard when you have a bad experience with somebody in law to respect those in positions of authority, isn't it? I mean, think about it like this. For those of you who have bad marriages, isn't it hard to enter marriage again? If you had somebody that was supposed to be your spouse, that was supposed to live according to an honor code, and they took advantage of that and they abused that? Or how about parents with children? Maybe one of the reasons why you don't want to have kids when you get older is because you've had a bad experience. Your parents abused their situation or abused their position. And so one of the mistakes that I see people make when it comes to this idea of government is they think that God appoints the man and not the plan. They think that God has appointed people like Hitler, Stalin, Mao, our former presidents, our presidents of today, and they mistake that because God created authority, that must mean that God has appointed the people in authority, and that's simply not true. Authority in government is good. What's the problem? It's when people like us fill that position because we're sinners and we make mistakes. And so he says, look, every person if you want to follow this honor code, if you want to be the person that God has called you to be, every person is to be in subjection to the governing authorities. Now, why in the world would Paul write Romans chapter 13? Well, the reason why he wrote Romans chapter 13 is because he wrote Romans chapter 12. He talks about the Christian's transformed life. He talks about how when God intervenes in a person's heart and he transforms their mind, certain things are going to change in their life. They're going to serve in the church. They're going to love people who are unlovable. They're going to serve those who they don't want to serve. They're going to use their God-given gifts to bring glory to him. Then he goes on to say this, live at peace with everyone. That's your job. Your job is not to be at war or to hate the people around you. Your job is to live at peace with everyone. And even when people do evil to you, he says in verse 17, do not repay evil for evil, but trust that God is in control. How do we trust that God is in control? Well, there are two ways that God takes care of things in this life. Number one is through civil government. So what is going to cause me to withhold if somebody attacks me from planning to attack them back? I trust civil government. I put them under the subjection of the law. The second thing that God takes care of is eternal judgment, knowing that if people hurt me, they will stand before God one day and they will answer according to their crimes, just like I will. And so one of the reasons why Paul wrote Romans 13 is because one of the ways that God carries out justice in this world is through civil authorities like the government. And we are not to take vengeance for our own selves, but we are to trust that God is in control and he will carry out his will how he sees fit through the civil authorities. That's why they exist. And so he says, everyone should be in subjection for there is no authority except from God. God has created the idea of authority and those which exist are established by God. This is governing authorities, those in positions of power, those who he goes on to say, bear the sword. Now, he uses this word submit. Do you know what submission means? And, and the gist of it, it means to obey. It includes this idea of obedience, but it's not limited to it. Dr. John Murray in his commentary on Romans writes this, it implies obedience when ordinances to be obeyed are in view, but it also includes the attitude of willing service or subservience. Think about it like this, parents. If you tell your children to go do something, and they huff, and they puff, and they complain, and they whine, but they still do the job anyways. Is that the kind of submission that you want as a parent? Well, no. Look, I tell my daughter to do something. You know what sometimes she does to me? She goes, mm-mm. <laughs> She's three years old. Mm-mm. Piper is her name. You need to do this. I'm only going to tell you one more time. And then sometimes she'll go, no. 
And I'm like, you must be watching your mom. <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, that's not fair, is it? Look, she's, it's probably because she's watching me. Uh, but the reality is, is that children, sometimes they don't want to submit. They don't want to obey. But look, I don't want my daughter just to do something because I've told her to do it. I want her to have the attitude and the willingness to do it. And sometimes I'll ask her to get me something. And she'll, she'll say, yeah, sure. Here you go, daddy. And I'm like, you're so good. I love you. And then other times she's stubborn and she's rotten like her little brother. Last night, I recorded a video. I wish I could show you. He climbs up. We started decorating for Christmas, by the way, okay? Just going to let you know. That's who I am. Yeah. Shame on you if you haven't. I'm a little late. But anyways, he stands up on our fireplace, and we've already hung the stockings, and he gets up, and he turns around. You know what he says to us? Get down! He points at us, because that's what we tell him. Knocks, get down. And it's not until daddy gets up that he actually gets down. And I know I've told you that a dozen times, but it's such a great story. He does it all the time. I love it. The idea is simply this, okay? We follow governing civil authority because ultimately we follow God. Think about it in the idea of church membership. Look, we have a very diverse group of people, people of all different backgrounds, really different ideals, different values. There are Republicans, independents, Democrats. There are young and old, black, white, all different kinds of ethnicities and skin colors. A lot of different type of people in here. But the gospel calls us to come together under the umbrella of truth, under the umbrella of Jesus, under the umbrella of the authority and the leadership of this church. And so think about it in this sense. Do we really want to be a church member who's constantly griping and complaining and arguing and rejecting the authority that God has clearly given our congregation? Can we voice our opinion? Absolutely. Are we always going to do everything that everyone wants? No, we can't do that. We're going to do the best job that we can. But think about being a little tyrannical, uh, really, person that's just always at odds with everyone. That's not who we're called to be as children. That's not how we're called to be as church members. And that's not what we're called to be even as people that are citizens of this great nation. And so what is it that Paul is trying to teach us Well, the main idea is simply this. We follow those who are in positions of authority because ultimately we follow God. And we may have to submit sometimes over to things that we don't necessarily like or agree on, but that doesn't mean we still shouldn't obey. I like to drive fast. I do. Man, 50 miles an hour on the highway drives me nuts. Back in Ohio, it's 50, 55 over the entire state. I mean, you feel like you're driving at the speed of smell. But that doesn't, I'm getting passed by birds. People on bicycles. This is the most frustrating thing when you're in traffic and people that are walking on bicycles pass you. I can't stand it. Can't stand it. This area, if you just pull up your map and you look at 6 p.m., the entire area is red from D.C. all the way up through Baltimore on both sides. I mean, it's absolutely insane. Traffic is terrible. But that doesn't mean we still shouldn't obey the law just because we don't like it. But there does come a time when we as Christians have to obey God rather than man. And there are laws that have passed in our land which do not reflect what is true and what is right and what is moral. And so as a Christian, when it comes to the point where you're having to choose between doing what is right and what is Christian and what is true and doing what is law, the Bible clearly tells us that we should obey God rather than man. That is the ultimate honor code that we as Christians follow. God first, family second, Country third. Dr. Jack Cottrell puts it like this. Civil government is inherently good, but it can be corrupted just like any other institution. If it becomes perverted to the point that it requires us to do something contrary to God's revealed will, then we must obey God rather than man, Acts 5.29. Governmental authority is binding upon all citizens, but it's not absolute. You know, when I think about the government and I think about laws that have been passed— I kind of align it to the idea of marriage. You know, you don't do away with the idea and the institution of marriage just because you had a bad experience in marriage. Just because husbands take advantage of their wives doesn't mean the idea of marriage is bad. Just because evil people hold positions in government does not mean the idea of government is necessarily bad. After all, authority is ultimately, as Paul argues, is created from God. And so when people went up and they asked Jesus, they tried to trick Jesus. You know what the Jews tried to do, the Jewish leaders? They wanted to put Jesus at odds with the people. And so they walked up to Jesus 
The Romans, they hated the Romans. They hated having to pay taxes. Can I get an amen? Uh, even though we do benefit from taxes like roads and police force and things like that. So really, I, I'm happy to pay for those things, okay? But uh, sometimes I feel like we're taxed a little too much, if you know what I'm saying. And I think I do a better job at managing my money than, uh, than the government. But uh, anyways, that's beside the point. So the idea is simply this. People went up to try to tr- trick Jesus into being at odds with the people. And so here's what they said. Should we pay taxes? Trick question. Because if Jesus says yes, he's at odds with the Jews who hate paying taxes. If he says no, who's he at odds with? The Roman government. And you know what Jesus says? Give to Caesar what is Caesar's and give to God what is God's. And they walked away in silence. What do you see on your dollar bill? United States and God we trust. But it's ultimately a paper, piece of paper that reflects our arbitrary amount that we've decided how much it reflects. We pay taxes, why? Because it's the right thing to do. And so the reason why we respect authority and why it's important is because God is the ultimate authority. Here's, the, here's what's at stake. Here's what's, what's at stake with the honor code. If we can't respect people in positions of authority, can we respect God? And we live in a highly individualistic, my way or the highway, my individual rights. We live in this society that says me over everyone else. I'm the most important thing. And that's ultimately a reflection of the gospel. What's at stake here with this idea of honor code and following the government? Our lives present a gospel message. And how you respond to police officers, how you respond to first responders, how you respond to people who are in positions of authority in our government, whether you like it or not or agree with them or not, ultimately reflects what you believe about the gospel. That's what's at stake. Do you honor God more than yourself? And so Paul says in verse 2, Therefore, whoever resists authority has opposed the ordinance of God. You're actually in opposition to God by being in opposition to those who are in authority. And they who have oppressed will receive condemnation upon themselves. Here's Here's the result. You're resisting. The word resist in the Greek means to rebel. It's a rebel. It's somebody who takes a stand against. It's rioting. It's rebelling. It's disobedience. And these things are not Christian. He says, they will receive condemnation. You receive condemnations twofold. First of all, what happens when you break the law? Well, the governing authorities execute justice. That's the purpose of government, to execute justice. But something else takes place. You will stand before God one day, and you have to give an account for why you chose to reject the authority of God and the authority of of those in civil government. You know, the violent protests that took place a few years ago in Baltimore, um, they're a terrible reflection of our community, a terrible reflection of what it means to be a citizen of the United States, but really it's a terrible reflection of what it means to be a Christian. And the officers as well, who have been indicted for taking advantage of their position of authority, arguably even more so Um, It's even more evil to be placed in a position of authority and take advantage of it. Those who were exposed for planting guns and drugs on innocent people, I mean, that, that is truly corrupt. It's truly evil on both sides of it. Even if you're in a position of authority, you're still called to obey the governing authorities according to the Word of God. And so ultimately, what's at stake is the gospel message, but ultimately what's at stake as well is your own life, your own integrity. What does a transformed life look like, according to Paul? You honor others above yourselves, and you follow the law. That's what he's saying. Look what he says in verse 13. For rulers are not a cause of fear for good behavior, but for evil. Do you want to have fear, no fear of authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise of the same. For it is a minister, the governing authority, look at this, is a minister of God to you for good. The purpose of government is not to strike fear in your heart as an upstanding citizen. The purpose of government as a minister of God is to execute justice, to give you peace and prosperity and hope to where you do not live in fear of criminal behavior. He says, but if you do what is evil, be afraid. Every time I pass a cop, boom, right to the break. Every time. Why? Why? Because I disobey the law, being totally transparent with you. I do not keep the law when it comes to driving the speed limit. And it's not right. And we laugh about it because sometimes it's funny. But it's ultimately a reflection 
of how we honor God and the people around us. You ever pass somebody going 55, they're going the speed limit, and you're like, dude, what a loser, going the speed limit. Come on, it's 55. It's the speed limit. All right, here's what he goes on to say. He says, it is a minister of God, an avenger who brings wrath on the one who practices evil. That's the purpose. Therefore, it is necessary to be in subjection, not only because of wrath, but also for conscience sake. And so he returns to this idea, why do we follow the law? Why is it the Christian thing to do? Well, first of all, it's ordained by God himself. But second of all, we have a fear of punishment. The primary purpose of government is to cause fear in relation to evil behavior. And this is very important. Why do authority, authorities exist? They exist to promote what is good and prohibit what is evil. And this word terror, terror for those who do evil, it comes from the word phobos. What does that sound like? Phobia. It's a fear. It's a fear of punishment. If we break the law, we should be afraid. Our legal system should operate in a sense of deterrence. If you do this, this is what will happen. You know, if you don't want to fear the authorities, you know what you can do? You can obey the law. Peter put it like this in 1 Peter chapter 2, be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to the governor as sent by him to punish those who do evil and praise those who do good. Why do we ultimately do this? Because we respect God, because we honor the Lord. Look at, look at the key verse in Romans 13, 4. He says, if you do wrong, be afraid for he does not bear the sword for nothing. Capital punishment is something that the Bible does endorse. You know, if I were to minister to somebody who murdered another person, I would share the gospel with them. I would baptize them into Christ. And then I would submit them to the law of the land. And if that demanded the death penalty, then so be it. You know, if I went out of my way to intentionally murder somebody, and I broke the law, as a Christian, of course, I'm called to repent, and it's something that I should do, but that doesn't mean that I still shouldn't subject myself to the law of the land. I got pulled over a few years ago. I had a headlight out. Believe it or not, I wasn't speeding, and you got that sick feeling in your stomach, and so I pulled over, and he comes up to the car. First thing I do, of course, is put my hands on the steering wheel, and uh, after I roll down you know, my window, and he comes up, and uh, he says, do you know why I pulled you over? I said, yep, and I deserve a ticket. That's exactly what I said. Well, he ends up giving me a warning. Pretty awesome, right? That was great. And so I had to replace my headlight. I already had the light bulb bought. I just didn't, uh, I hadn't replaced it yet. But you know what? I'm guilty. And we're all guilty. And it should strike fear in our hearts because the government doesn't bear the sword for no reason. We should be advocates for justice. It doesn't matter if you're the president of the United States. It doesn't matter if you were the president or you're going to run for the president. Everybody ultimately submits to the law of the land, and there shouldn't be any exceptions just because you hold a position of power, especially for those who abuse their authority. You know, one of the organizations that I'm a huge advocate of um, is called IJM. Their name is International Justice Mission. They're a Christian organization. And one of the purposes, one of the things that they do is they go into our country and to countries in the rest of the world, and they go after people who are sexual predators, people who have abused their relationship, abused their authority, and they seek to bring justice to the world. Now, I think they do a very, very good thing. Our ultimate call is to bring love and compassion as the church, to teach the gospel. But we still should be advocates of justice. Just because it's not our primary purpose does not mean it's not something that we should support or pray for or want. We should be looking to people in our government saying, bring justice, bring justice, do what is right. That's the ultimate purpose for the government. Timothy put it like this. Have you ever found it hard to pray for somebody you don't like in political office? Maybe you don't like our president. Maybe you won't like the next president. But you know what the Bible calls us to do? Not only obey those in positions of authority, but even pray for them. Paul wrote this to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. He says, First of all, then, I urge that supplications, which are requests, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for all people, 
for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead peaceful and a quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. And this is good, and it is pleasing in the sight of God, our Savior, who desires for all people to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Paul wrote this to Timothy while he was under house arrest in Rome for being persecuted for his faith. Totally unjustified for what Paul was going through. And yet he says, look, at the end of the day, we need to pray for these people. We want to be and have a life of peace. We want to live a godly life. We want to live a dignified life. We need to pray for people who are in positions of authority and power, even if we don't like them, even if we don't agree with them. Why? Because ultimately, we want to be at peace with God and with each other. You know, sometimes I do find it hard to pray for our local government or people who have been in positions of government, because I have such strong beliefs and convictions about what the gospel teaches. And I want what's best for us and for our nation, for our county. I want to live and breathe the gospel, and I want to be able to preach and teach what the Bible preaches and teaches without being subject to persecution from governing authorities. You know, there are things that go on in our county that I strictly, frankly, disagree with. Next week, parents, I do want to warn you, I'm going to be talking about how this honor code transcends to our family relationships, the relationships of husband and wife and parents and children. And I'm going to be talking about some things that have happened in our local county as far as what can a Christian do when he's at odds with what the culture says about sex and about who we are as a person. I'm going to be talking about things like the LGBT community, things that are happening in our own community how we handle things between a husband and a wife and parents and their children. And so we are going to be talking about some things that are sexual. So I do want to warn you about that next week. But ultimately, there are things that I disagree with, with certain things that are going on in our county. And you know what I decided to do this week? I decided to reach out and set up a meeting, have some coffee or lunch with some local community representatives, people that are in positions of power and influence over our government institutions. And you know what happened? They were receptive. They want to meet. They want to talk. They want to hear from us. And it's okay to express your convictions to other people. But ultimately, we need to respect the law of the land. We need to pray for these people who are in positions of power and influence. That's what the gospel is calling us. That's what it means to be an honorable person. You know, I do cling to conservative principles. I really don't care about being labeled uh, to one political affiliation or another. Like I said, I think the government, for the most part, should keep its nose out of my business. When it comes to my money and my way of life and who I am as a person and what I believe and what I do, for the most part, I think, I think government should mind its own business and exercise the authority of the land. But that doesn't mean I still shouldn't respect and follow the government and pray for them. You know, ultimately, the government's job is to protect our rights, not to provide everything we have a right to. And I think that's where people get the gospel and government mixed up, is we think that the government is responsible for providing us everything we have a right to. And that's just simply not true. The government's primary job is to protect our rights, not provide everything that we have a right to. So whether it's a right to property or a right to college education, or a right to self-improvement, or a right to choose friends, or a right to be employed. The government protects those rights. So if I'm trying to apply to a college, and they say because Rick is a 5'8 white male, uh, he comes from a Caucasian background, we don't want him to come to this college because we don't want white people here. The government's job is to protect that fundamental right against racism, but not to provide college education for me for free. That's not what the Bible teaches about the role of government. You see, everyone has a right to college education, but not everyone has a right to have that paid for by the government. That's not what the Bible teaches. Now, whether or not that's your political belief, that's one thing, but that's not what the Bible reflects. And so if I could put it in a succinct way, here's what I would say. The purpose of the government is to maintain temporal law and order. The purpose of the church is to provide spiritual salvation. That is our job as a congregation, as a movement, as a Christian The principle by which the government operates is justice. The principle by which the church operates is grace, forgiveness. I can still go share the gospel with somebody who's broken the law while at the same time supporting my government and imprisoning this person. These are two separate entities with two separate separate principles. And then finally, the power by which the government accomplishes its purpose is force. 
And the power by which the church accomplishes its purpose is love. And the problem comes in when we confuse the two. And so I want to challenge you this week. As you think about honoring those above yourselves, think about how you can honor people who are in positions of authority. How can you pray for our government officials? How can you pray for our police officers? How can you pray for those who have even taken advantage of their position? And how can you ask God to work in their life to bring them to repentance? How can you pray and how can you allow the Spirit of God to work on your heart to give you the power to do what is right even when you disagree with what the law states and what the law exemplifies? And so what should we do next? Well, I think the most powerful thing that you can do as a Christian is vote is vote. Don't just sit back on the sidelines. Don't be too proud to say, well, I don't like either person, and so I'm not going to choose the lesser of two evils. Get out there and exercise your fundamental right to vote. The Bi- Jack Cottrell has to say this. He says, many Christians, you know, when we think about who we should vote for, he says, many Christian politicians have a perverted understanding of the purpose of government and are not fit to hold civil office. Think about that. We should not vote for a particular candidate just because he's a Christian. The candidate who wants government to do what God wants it to do is the one who should get our vote. At the end of the day, I will vote for somebody who upholds the biblical principles of government and who's not a Christian over somebody who is a Christian and has a perverted understanding of government and what the Bible teaches. So cast your vote. Influence who we are as a nation and what we cling to uh, as a government. And so we ask ourselves these questions. Does the candidate look upon the government as a primary protector or a provider? How does the uh, understanding that the government is primarily a protector and provider, how does this policy influence his national defense position, his law and order, his capital punishment? How does it influence things like abortion, discrimination, taxation, and welfare? When this candidate is running for office, do they reflect the intention and purpose of government? Which candidate most clearly understands the role of government, and does it align with my biblical values? Does this candidate look upon the government as somebody that's primarily motivated by love and compassion or justice and truth? And so it doesn't matter at the end of the day if they're Christian or not Christian. Ultimately, what matters is do they uphold the biblical values that we cling to as a Christian? Now, we all hope that they are, right? We hope that they are Christians. The second thing that you can do, the most powerful thing that you can do with this information is not only vote, but obey the law. Look what he says in Romans 13, 5. He says, obey the law for conscience sake. Honor the law. Honor God. Why? Because it's the right thing to do. And if we obey the law, we're going to follow the most important honor code you'll ever find in the Bible. And you know what that is? Love God. And love your neighbor as you love yourself. And so we'll end right here with Romans 13, 6 through 10. Look at how Paul ultimately concludes this. He says this in verse 6. For because of this, he says, obey the law for conscience sake, because after all, this is why you pay taxes. For the authorities are ministers of God attending to this very thing. Pay to all what is owed them. Taxes to whom taxes are owed. Do I pay taxes? You better believe it. Revenue, to whom revenue is owed. Respect, to whom respect is owed. You see, often we think the government deserves our money because it's law. But you know what the Bible also says? Those in positions of authority deserve our respect. What if they're not very respectful? It doesn't matter. We are called to honor those whom honor is due. One of the reasons why I respect the President of the United States is because of the position that he holds. One of the reasons why I respect our governor and people in our county is because of the position that they hold. You know, I watched um, Band of Brothers. It's like one of my favorite uh, TV series that HBO ran. Um, It was on World War II and the Airborne Division. And one of the guys that was primarily the focal point of the story is um, Lieutenant Winters. And uh, Dick Winters was his name. Uh, Really, these are true. These are real people's real stories. Dick Winters is his name, and they actually wrote a book on it. And I listened to the book on audio, and it's fantastic. It's great. I highly encourage everyone to listen to the audio book. But anyways, um, he started out as a lieutenant, and he had a captain over him, Captain Sobel. And uh, this guy was really a nightmare. I mean, he was tyrannical. He was mean-spirited. He pushed Easy Company farther and harder than any company was ever pushed. He constantly revoked their weekend passes. I mean, you watch the first couple episodes, you're like, wow, this guy's a jerk, and I do not like him. 
I mean, that's really, that's really the intention uh, that they were trying to give, and that's how the guys in his unit felt. Well, eventually, Lieutenant Winters, he ends up getting promoted um, all the way up to major, and it goes through almost the end of the story, and who comes uh, up to Lieutenant Winters as he's walking by? That's Captain Sobel. Well, now Lieutenant Winters is over him. He has the rank and the authority. And for those of you who are familiar with military, I'm not too familiar with military, but one thing I know that they do is they always salute those who are in higher position of rank. And so here comes Captain Sobel. It's towards the end of the series. They're over in Europe. They've beat Hitler. They've conquered. They've won. And Captain Sobel is walking by, and uh, now um, Major Winters is sitting there. And you know what the captain does, Captain Sobel? He puts his head down, and he doesn't salute him. And the guy next to him does. Captain Sobel! And he stops, turns around at attention, and he says this. You salute the rank, not the man. And so even though you don't like me, because we were at odds, I was your former lieutenant, and we really didn't care too much for you, at the end of the day, we honor those to whom honor is due. We respect those to whom respect is due, because that's what God wants us to do. And so he says in verse 8, owe no one anything except this. This is what you owe me, and this is what I owe you, except to love one another. For the one who loves one another has fulfilled the law. Now, he's talking about the Mosaic law. If you really want to obey the law, ultimately, it's wrapped up in this idea of love one another. That's what we owe each other. And what does love ultimately do? Love ultimately wants the best for the other person. When we love people in positions of authority that disagree with us, we ultimately want what's best for them because we believe that God exists and Jesus resurrected from the dead and truth exists and we know it and we want to share it and we want to proclaim it and we want to act in such a way that honors other above ourselves but stands firm on the sacredness of truth and love. And so he says this in verse 9, for the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment are summed up in this word, you shall love your neighbor as you love yourself, for love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, it's the fulfillment of the law. Excuse me. I just burped there. <laughs> Did you hear that? I couldn't help it. I'm sorry. That's so rude, but it was like it's my body. I think that's the first time that's ever happened to me in a sermon. <laughs> I've sneezed, I've coughed, and that was an accidental burp. I'm totally sorry about that. I'm normal. What can I say? Regardless, that was such a good point, and my burp ruined it. But the idea is simply this. Love is the fulfillment of the law. And if you want to follow the honor code that God has given us, if you want to honor others above yourselves, love will accomplish that. Love wins. Let's stand and let's pray. Lord, we give you thanks, uh, God. For-